you guys hear me well? Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So uh, this is Foundations of Deep Learning course. My name is Sohel Faizi, and I'm very happy to be your instructor in this course. I hope uh, you have had a good summer, and I hope you and your family are doing well in these uh, complicated situations. Uh, so let's start. So today I'm going to first uh, briefly talk about the structure of the course and also um, some top topics that we are going to cover. And then we'll basically uh, dive into some technical uh, portions of this lecture in terms of understanding basic deep learning uh, models and optimization problem. So first of all, um, uh, this is an advanced deep learning course. So you need to have some basic machine learning and deep learning background before taking this course. If you don't have such a background, I encourage you to first take some introductory course in machine learning and deep learning. And maybe the next years you can take uh, advanced courses in deep learning. So topics that we are going to cover, these are pretty advanced and modern topics, uh, including deep learning optimization, deep learning generalization, neural tangent kernels, lottery tickets, uh, deep learning robustness in terms of adversarial attacks and defenses. Then we are going to look into relaxing the IID assumption uh, in terms of domain adaptation and out of domain generalization. We will spend a couple of lectures on deep generative models, VAEs, GANs, flow-based models, and their mean max optimization problems. We'll spend a lecture on self-supervised deep learning and a few lecture on deep reinforcement learning. And uh, we'll have one lecture on attentions and transformers and LSTMs, Bayesian deep learning, explainable uh, deep learning, fairness, graph neural networks, meta learning, federated learning, privacy and ethics. So as you can see, this is a very long list of topics. These topics are very important and modern, but in order to be able to cover these topics, I definitely need your help. So you need to read the papers that we are posting for each lecture before the lecture. So I cannot emphasize it more that it is very important that you read these papers before coming to the class. And some of these papers are uh, pretty technical. So uh, in, uh, in order to be able to digest these papers, you should start reading it you know, a couple of days before the lecture. So don't wait until the last hour before the lecture, because in that case, probably it will be hard to understand and digest the concepts and techniques of uh, these papers. So another thing is that these papers and topics, it's a tentative list. So we may add or remove some of the topics along the way. And this is the first basically draft of this course. So we'll see uh, how things turn out. In terms of the questions, I don't want this course to be a monologue, even though we are in a virtual uh, setup. Uh, probably most of you have taken some other courses with me. I like to get questions and you know, have some dialogue uh, within the lectures. So you have two options. One is to use the raise uh, hand bottom in the, um, uh, in the Zoom, or you can just post your questions in the chat box and I'll read your questions to the class and uh, try to answer them. Any questions so far? Okay, good. So let's look at course info. <clears throat> As I mentioned, I'm the course instructor and we'll have three amazing TAs for this course, Aya, Neha, and Mukang. Uh, they'll help me and uh, you, know, you in uh, different parts of this course. The topics, you know, it's basically the same topics that we saw earlier. Lectures will be online, so I'm recording these lectures. And after each uh, class, I'm going to post these lectures. But I strongly encourage all of you to participate uh, in these virtual lectures, because as I mentioned, I like to have a lot of Q&A type conversations during the lectures. So office hours, my office hour will be right after Tuesday's lectures, uh, starting next week. And TA office hours uh, will announce it uh, shortly. In terms of the background, as I mentioned, this is an advanced course. 
So you need to have a strong background in linear algebra, probability and optimization. And also you need to have some basic background in machine learning and deep learning. Uh, otherwise, it will be hard uh, for you to follow some of the lectures that we'll have. And obviously, you need to have some programming backgrounds in Python. So the course is going to be heavily project oriented. So we are going to have a mini conference in this course. So how does it work? So Students, they're gonna form groups and similar to some other machine learning conferences, we'll have a double blind uh, submission and review process. Uh, so basically uh, each student uh, also will uh, act as a reviewer. So you will review three submissions in a double blind format and everything you know, should be in a double blind format. Uh, otherwise there will be a heavy penalty on that. And each submission can have up to four students. So we encourage to, uh, for you to form teams uh, and collaborate with other students. I understand it is a little bit difficult, especially since we are in a virtual situation, but uh, we have Piazza that uh, you can post your uh, problems or projects and then see if other students are interested in joining your, um, your team. So one thing to emphasize is all deadlines are final and we won't extend it because the deadlines are cascaded. So if we extend one of them, it's gonna be hard to adjust every other deadline. So here are the important dates for us. The beginning of October, you need to form your team and you need to select a topic, a project. Uh, in a week, we are going to give you a feedback, ups or downs, uh, and the first week of November, there's an abstract submission deadline, so you'll post your abstracts. And within a week of that, you'll have your full paper in ICML format. And then the review period will start right after that. You'll be assigned to three papers in groups, and you review these papers. And after that, we'll have a rebuttal period. So we'll reveal these uh, reviews to authors of the papers, and have them uh, basically write uh, responses to the comments raised by the reviewers. And after that, we'll have a couple of days for discussions among reviewers. And after that, uh, ACs, uh, which will be my TAs and myself, will finalize the scores for each paper and also evaluate reviewers. So we'll have another uh, part, uh, lecture scribing. Uh, we already shared the Google uh, sheet for you to sign up to scribe lectures. Uh, I'm gonna basically share the notes, uh, these scribe notes after each lecture. So in addition to having the videos for the lectures, you will have access to some uh, scribe notes from the lectures. In terms of the exams, we'll have only one exam and that is in fact required because this is a qualifying course. We'll have one final exam it is take home and it will be on 3rd of December. So in terms of the grading, we'll have 10% for the lecture scribe, we have 25% for the final, 40% for the paper score and 25% for the review score. As you can see, it is heavily project oriented. 65% of your grades will basically come from the project and also the reviews that you'll be doing for, uh, for other uh, papers. All right. So that is it for the course uh, introduction. Um, if you have any questions, I think it's a good time either to raise your hand or post it on the chat box. All right, so I see that you know, there's a conflict for some of you for office hours. Um, you know, it's a, this is a very big class, so it is very hard uh, to find a time that works for everyone, but I will try to, some weeks, I'll try to change the timing for my office hours. So uh, hopefully with high probability, all of you will be able to attend uh, in some of my office hours. All right, so there's another question. What is the typical team size you're expecting for the project? Uh, it is up to four, but we are very flexible to be honest. So you can do a project by yourself, you know, two with, you know, one another student or some 
you know, other students. Uh, we don't want, you know, the only thing is that we don't want like maybe like 15 of you to, you know, bundle up and like have one project. So because in that case, it will be a little bit harder for us to evaluate contributions of each student. But even we are, we can be flexible in that case. If you think that, okay, maybe five of you uh, have some really interesting ideas and you have a plan for each student to work on a specific aspect of that project, you can definitely talk to me and we'll work it out. So I see a hand is raised. Uh, please ask your question. Oh, hi. So Dr. Sohail, so you said in this class we have a chance actually to work out a paper, basically in your group, is that? Uh, for, the, for the assignment, yeah. Uh, sorry, can you repeat your question in terms of the projects or in terms of the papers that we'll be reading for the lectures? Uh, so uh, you, uh, I mean, so I saw actually from the syllabus in this class, we basically have a chance to actually make a paper by ourselves. Is that the, the idea? Yes. Right? So that is yeah. basically a project. So oh, a project. Yeah. yeah. So you'll basically within a project, you'll basically uh, you know write a paper uh, oh, for this yeah. course. And as I, I, I should mention that you cannot, in a way, quote unquote, recycle your previous. Uh, projects and papers, right? So I know most of you are doing already some great research with your, you know, advisors and supervisors. Um, uh, for this course, you cannot resubmit some of your previous work. So we want you to, you know, think about some new problems or some related problems that you have not, you know, conducted the research for that and do it within this course in order to be fair, um, you know, to uh, all students. I thank you. Very well. So I see some more questions. Um, could we use this course project for uh, two different courses? No, unless um, you know you basically have very separate goals and separate um, you know techniques that you are developing uh, for different courses. So you cannot submit one project to multiple courses. There's another question. What would an example of a project be? it's very open-ended. So as I mentioned, this is not an undergrad course, right? So we are not gonna give you like specific guidelines of like, you know, this is the, you know, problem that you need to work on for the next week. So this is a research course. So you can take a look into some, uh, some of the topics, some of the papers that we are covering in this course, get some ideas or maybe, you know, come up with different uh, topics. So we are very flexible in that sense. So there's uh, one more question. Can students who are auditing or attending the course submit projects? Uh, in that case, uh, you should contact me and course TAs to discuss, you know, because this is a big course. We want to make sure that we, you know, have, um, you know, resources in terms of uh, reviewing and in terms of uh, handling the you know, different projects. So if you're auditing, you are not, you know, uh, officially registered to the course, uh, contact the TAs and myself, and we can uh, see if it is a good fit for you to um, uh, work on a class project. Okay, so one more question. Is there some online forum where we can try to form groups? Yes, I think I skipped it. Uh, there is a Piazza link. Here, so you should register to that, and maybe you know there you can post your uh, ideas and form a team uh, on Piazza. It's very easy to use if you haven't used it before. All right, one more question: Is there a metric or a quiz to see if we know enough of the required background? We'll potentially, you know, post uh, uh, some maybe background documents. Um, uh, you can actually take a look into some of the previous courses that I have taught. You can go to my course webpage, uh, 726, a machine learning course. Take a look at the backgrounds and take a look at the lectures of that class and see if um, it is you know, easy for you to follow it. And today I'm going to briefly cover some of these uh, topics and you'll see if uh, it is uh, easy for you to uh, follow some of these concepts that we'll be covering. Okay, so one more question. Can we have a list of potential projects? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, as I mentioned, 
you know, I want you to think about these uh, uh, projects or ideas yourself. So it is not an undergrad course uh, and we are very flexible uh, in, you know, basically admitting different types of project, either practical or theoretical. And final question, is there any example of lecture scribing that we can refer to? Uh, I think today we'll start the, basically there is like an overleaf uh, link that we have already shared. Uh, I think after today's lecture, you can just like follow that format. So there's some formatting already integrated in that overleaf. Okay, so I think that's all for the questions. Uh, let's start the technical part of today's lecture. So as you know, most of you know, I usually like whiteboards. So unfortunately we don't have uh, a physical whiteboard here, but we'll try to use some virtual whiteboard within this course. <clears throat> All right, so in order to <clears throat> do that, so I need to connect my tablet. <clears throat> So we have some Okay, do you guys see my uh, my note and do you hear me well? Yes. Okay, fantastic. So this part was the hardest part. So I wasn't sure if it is gonna work out or not, but it seems it is working. All right. So, um, so today we are going to uh, talk about basic deep learning uh, models and optimization problems. As I mentioned, I expect you to already be familiar with most of these uh, topics. Uh, so I'm gonna go very quickly. So if you think that you know, it is hard for you to follow it, you know, contact TAs and myself to see if this course is a good fit for you. All right, so this is CMSC 828W Foundations of Deep learning. Okay, so let's start with, uh, with a note or perhaps a remark. So deep learning is a very fast uh, moving area. Probably you have noticed most of or most of the papers and the topics that we'll be covering in this course, of this course, they are very uh, recent uh, topics and papers. I would say perhaps within, most of them within the last five years. So one uh, interesting question, is to see uh, if I teach this course in the 
you know, in the next uh, in five years, how different different these topics and papers will be. Let's say in five years. Uh, so it is a very so. The reason I'm mentioning and I'm highlighting this is that you should not um, take any of these uh, concepts and topics as uh, basically a definite uh, you know, concept that explains deep learning. So it is a very fast moving area. Every year we are learning more and more uh, why deep learning is powerful and also what are the limitations of deep learning. So this course is perhaps you know, uh, a good starting point to think a little bit about different aspects of deep learning uh, that potentially can evolve and change within the next decade as well. Okay, so today's agenda is so we are going to cover basic deep learning models and architectures. We'll start with the ERM, empirical risk minimization. We'll then talk about the loss functions that we use in ERM. Then we'll talk about the models uh, that uh, we use in order to have a mapping from inputs to the outputs. And finally, we'll look into the optimization problems and how we solve these optimizations in practice. All right, so we start with supervised learning setup. In supervised learning, I'm given a data set like this, xi's and yi's. I have n samples. X's are my uh, features and y's are my labels. All right, so what are the dimensions? You usually assume x is in a high dimensional space, let's say in a d-dimensional space. Uh, y's uh, can be a lower dimension. Uh, we here assume y's are in one dimension, but you can have uh, c classes if you do like a you know, C-class um, classification problem. So you can also assume why is in C. C is usually like, you know, not as large as uh, D in general. But for the most part of today's lectures, just to introduce some of the concepts, I'm going to assume Y is in reals, one dimensional uh, space. So we have uh, basically two types of problems uh, within this. We can have regression problem and we can have classification problem. In the regression problem, we assume the labels that we have there in reals. For instance, if you wanna predict housing prices, that would be a regression problem. And the classification problem, we assume the labels are in a finite field. For instance, in a binary classification problem, let's assume the labels are either minus one or one, or in a multi-label classification problem, we assume the labels are, let's say from one to three, the integer numbers. All right, so what is the goal here? So our goal is very clear in supervised learning. So we'll talk about reinforcement learning and unsupervised learning, and in fact, self-supervised learning later on in this, in this course, but let's start with the supervised learning. Our goal is to find a function, let's say fw, from my input space, d-dimensional input space, to my output space, uh, to r, such that fw of xi is a good predictor of yi for all of my training samples. So w here is representing my model parameters. All right, so that's the goal. So I wanna basically find this function mapping my inputs to uh, outputs. All right, so how I can uh, find such a function? 
we formulate an optimization problem. We are minimizing a loss function, an average loss function over training samples. One over M, so I have a loss function between my predictions, if W of XI and YI. And I pick a model, I pick a W that minimizes this loss function. So this is called empirical risk minimization. This is called ERM, empirical risk minimization. Okay, so why em uh, empirical risk minimization? Because we are uh, basically looking at the average loss over all training sets. So another way to write this optimization uh, the objective of this optimization, which is uh, probably easier to write it up, is I'm looking at the expected loss over my samples coming from my training set. I have PXYN, that's my training set. I'm looking at the uh, average loss from uh, between F of X and Y. So this is another way, a more uh, compact way of uh, writing uh, the objective of this loss function. All right, so, uh, next, I'm going to uh, dissect this optimization. I'm going to first talk about the loss function here, and then I'm going to talk about the models, FW, here. And finally, I'm going to talk about this whole optimization and how we uh, solve this optimization problem. Uh, but before going forward, uh, are there some questions? OK, so let me see. Okay, so one question is about the definition of deep learning. Uh, so I'll talk about that uh, in a bit. Is there any example of lecture scribing? So I think we covered that uh, questions already. All right, so let's uh, first talk about choices for, uh, actually there's a hand raised. Um, yes, please go ahead, Kazal. Oh, awesome, thank you. So uh, just by the statement expected uh, loss uh, of F, uh, uh, just the right portion. So um, say that uh, your uh, problem is classifying some data into two different categories, like zero or one, uh, but the zero category happens 99% of the time. The one category happens 1% of the time. So would we do this expectation given that data distribution or would we try to not take into account the underlying distribution of one of them actually occurs a lot more than the other category? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, so the formulations of ERM is that we are weighing samples equally. So we don't care about the types of labels that they have. If you have like 99% positive samples and 1% negative samples, Anyway, so you are weighing them equally, but if you solve them, then your majority class may uh, outpower your minority class. So we'll talk in, uh, in fact, the fairness lecture and some other lectures, how we can renormalize some of the ways in order to reduce biases of basically uh, the ERM optimization problem. But for now, let's assume all samples are weighed equally. So that's the formulation that we consider in this lecture. Okay, awesome, thanks. Very good, good question. All right, so uh, what are the choices for the loss function? So that's the star cho choices of uh, the loss function. So in the regression problem, when my y is in real domain, so a good loss function is quadratic loss. So here we have fw of x is in real. So I'm going to use a quadratic loss which is defined as um, loss between fw of x and y, the quadratic norm between fw and x and y. It's very simple. 
So we like this loss function for many reasons. Um, one of the reason is that the derivative of a quadratic function is linear, so it makes the analysis easy. Other reasons are it is differentiable, it is a smooth function. Uh, so that's why quadratic loss is one of the very popular loss, especially in the regression problem. Now let's look at the classification problem. Okay, in the classification problem, also the output of my uh, network, FW, will be in reals. But my labels are in, let's say, in a, a binary field. So it is either minus one or plus one. So first I need to convert these real numbers to some uh, binary labels. So in order to do that, one way is uh, to uh, threshold it. So if you look at the output that you have, if W of X, if it is positive, you predict the label one, otherwise you predict the label zero or uh, minus one. And my loss function would be just comparing the labels that I'm predicting with my true labels. So in that case, my loss would be something like this. So I have uh, if w of x times y. If both f w and y, they have the same signs, it means I do not have any error because my prediction will be uh, plus one. My y, my y is also plus one, so I don't have any error. If f w times y is negative, it means the signs are different, so I'll have one unit of error. So this is the uh, zero, one loss function. So zero, one loss function. Okay, so the zero, one loss function, we don't like it as much as quadratic loss. Um, there are a lot of reasons. One reason is that it is a non-convex function, as you can see here. Uh, and another reason is that the gradient of this function, if you look at the derivative in different points, it is almost everywhere zero. So that means the gradient doesn't uh, provide information, uh, especially if we use the gradient information in order to update model parameters. So that's one of a couple of drawbacks for the zero one loss function. It is also non-smooth. So in order to deal with these uh, problems, we uh, approximated. We approximated using a function called hinge loss. So we uh, have, instead of the zero one loss, so we have a hinge loss. So hinge, when fw times y is above one, it is zero. So that part is basically the same as the zero one loss. But before that, it linearly increases the, uh, the loss that we see between fw of x and y. So formally speaking, the hinge loss is defined as max between zero and one minus y times fw of x. You can see here if this uh, quantity y times fw of x is above one, so this whole thing is negative, then uh, max of zero and that negative number will be zero. Uh, that's this part. And the other part uh, will basically a linear function with respect to fw of x times y. And there are some you know, other justifications for the hinge loss based on the uh, margin maximization. Uh, take a look at the SVM uh, literature in order to uh, see that justification for the hinge loss using margin maximization. Okay, so I see there is a question. Let me see. Um, is the quadratic loss equation, in the quadratic loss equation, why do we have the one half? Good question. It is just for mathematical convenience because when you take the derivative here, so this two comes down here. So two and one over two cancel, cancels out. So you don't actually need like, you know, this one over half. It's just a linear uh, constant scaling. It doesn't change anything, but it is uh, convenient to not carry these constants when you are looking at the gradient of the loss. 
Good question. All right, so regression, in the regression, we have quadratic loss. In classification, we talked about the hinge loss. And let's talk about the cross entropy loss as well, uh, which is another very popular loss in the classification uh, problem. Cross entropy loss. Okay, so here, um, or analysis is based on maximum likelihood optimization. Based on maximum likelihood optimization. Okay, so first we need to convert these outputs of my network, FW of X, to probabilities. And in order to do that, we are going to use a sigmoid function. Sigmoid is a function that maps uh, the real to um, a number between zero and one. So this is the sigmoid function. G of Z is one over uh, one plus E to the minus C. If Z is like plus infinity, this function approaches one. If uh, Z is minus infinity, this function is approaches zero. And at uh, zero, it is in fact one over half. Right, so we use this function in order to turn this FW of X, which is the output of my network into a probability. And then I'm going to use this probability, if this probability is above half, uh, in other words, if FW of X is positive, then I'm going to predict a positive label. Otherwise, I'm going to predict a negative label. So we basically say we have this uh, generative model for labels. The probability of Y given X and a particular W is g of f w of x and the probability of y to be zero is just the complement of this one minus g of f w of x that's it so in other words you you can combine both of these uh, equations you can write probability of y given x and w is nothing but g of f w of x to the power of y times one minus g of f of w of x to the power one minus y. Why is this the case? Because when y is zero, then uh, this term goes away. So I got one minus g of f w of x. When y is one, the second term goes away. And the first term is g of f w of x. So I basically summarize these two equations in one equation here. All right, so then we just write the maximum likelihood optimization uh, for this. Uh, the maximum likelihood optimization would maximize over my model parameters the likelihood of observing this data set from this model. And we are also assuming independence among samples that we are drawing from this model. So the probability of observing this data set will be the product of observing individual samples of the data set from this particular model. So this is the optimization for the maximum likelihood. Uh, because log is a, a monotonically increasing function with a loss of generality, this is equivalent if I apply a log function to the objective function because I don't like the product. A right? product of a lot of uh, small uh, numbers, these properties are between zero and one. When n is large, it may introduce some numerical uh, issues. So I apply a log function and I get some one over n log of probability of yi given xi and w. And I have already uh, have a formula for this. So I'm just going to replace it here. So log of this term will be y times log of g f w of x plus one minus y times log of one minus g f w of x. And I'm gonna change this max to a min and put a minus sign. Uh, it is basically the same thing. So this will be min over w minus some one to n y times log of g f w of x plus one minus y times log of one minus g f w of x. And that's it, congratulations. This is the cross entropy loss function.
cross entropy loss. Why is it called cross entropy loss? Because it is uh, very similar. If you change these y's to the same probabilities as the arguments of the log, you'll get the Shannon entropy. That's why this is called cross entropy loss function. So I just want to add a note here. So this is for the uh, binary classification problem that we use the sigmoid to turn these numbers uh, into probabilities. In the multi-label case, uh, instead of the sigmoid, you, we often use softmax function. So let me just add that note. Uh, in the multi-label classification problem, use softmax. It's a function very similar to the sigmoid uh, to turn real numbers to probabilities. Softmax to turn logits to probabilities. If you are not familiar with softmax, I think you should uh, take a look into the definition of that. Okay, so uh, that's all for the loss functions. Uh, I See, there's a question. Let me take that. So the question, isn't the likelihood function probability of uh, data given x? Uh, OK, so there are basically uh, different ways of looking at this problem. So here we, we want to say, if you have a model, then what is the probability of observing a particular data uh, from the model. So my model has both labels and features. But since the uh, probability of the features, uh, you know, we actually don't care about it. So you can see that becomes constant in my optimization problem. And that's why we uh, don't need to write it up. So this is basically probability of yi comma xi. And, prob and using the Bayes rule, you have like probability of yi given xi times probability of xi. But probability of xi doesn't depend on my model parameters, so it becomes constant. OK, any other questions? There is a hand raised. Alexander, please go ahead. Hi. Um, if you have a situation where the labels themselves are probabilities instead of just a 0 or a 1, is there a way to have a loss function that takes that into account better? The labels are probabilities. Um, yeah, probably. So you can, even in that case, you can use a quadratic loss. Uh, if you wanna, pre if your label is a number between zero and one, but I'm sure you can even cook up with, you know, some better loss function. So uh, here actually I should mention these loss functions, uh, probably the most popular ones, uh, but we have many, many other loss functions. So don't, you know, feel that you are limited to only using these loss functions. Okay, very good. Um, other questions? All right, so let's um, move on to um, the next part. Okay. Uh, Recall what was the ERM optimization problem. We are minimizing over W, the average loss over my samples, loss FW of XI and YI. Okay. So we already know uh, about this loss function. So we have hinge loss, cross entropy loss, and quadratic loss. Now we wanna see what is FW of X. FW is a function mapping from a d-dimensional space to, in this, in our case, a one-dimensional space uh, from uh, rd to r. So what is the simplest function that you can uh, use for such a mapping? The simplest function would be a linear function. So in that case, we have a linear or a fine if you add the bias term. So what is the form of that function? So you have fw of x, w transpose x plus b. Okay, I'm gonna add use a little bit of notation. This w here 
is basically the set of all of my model parameters. So it's, you can think about the full W. And this W here uh, is the weights, uh, part of my weights, and B is the bias stem. So this W has both of these uh, W and Bs. It's an abuse of notation. All right, so this is good. Uh, what, why we like uh, linear models? We like it because my loss is convex, either cross entropy or hinge or quadratic. When my FW is linear, the whole thing becomes convex. So I have a convex optimization uh, problem. And we know how to uh, characterize global optimizers for that optimization problem. So the plus for this is uh, I basically get a convex optimization problem. So I'm happy about it. But what about the negative uh, sides for using a linear affine function? It is pretty limited in terms of the representation power. So especially in practice, you may have nonlinear, pretty nonlinear relationships between X and Y. So restricting ourselves to a linear model uh, won't probably be good in those cases. So we have here limited representation uh, power for these functions. So we are a little bit sad. So in order to deal with this, uh, we look into nonlinear functions from uh, x to y. OK, so how can I add nonlinearity here? So let's uh, look at this linear function again. I have w transpose x plus b. That's my output. So in other words, I have, say, x1 to xt. These are different components of my x. I multiply each of them with a weight, w1. x2 is multiplied by w2. xd is multiplied by wd. I sum them up. So this is the w transpose times x part. And I add a bias term to it. And this is the output of my linear mapping. So this part would be W transpose X plus B. This is the linear or affine transformations that I have. So in order to add a little bit of a nonlinearity to my mapping, so what one thing I can do is very simple. So I can just add a nonlinear function here. Let's say I have phi and my output would be phi of W transpose x plus b. And phi is a nonlinear function. We call it an activation function. Activation function. All right, congratulations. This is perhaps the simplest neural network. So this is a mapping from the dimensional space to a one dimensional space. It is nonlinear. So this. Uh, Architecture is a simple neural network architecture. But like this nonlinearity is uh, not a lot, right? So we need to add a little bit more nonlinearity in order to have a better, uh, stronger representation power. So how we can do that? Uh, first of all, I'm gonna summarize this picture because I don't wanna like uh, write down Ws and Bs and phi separately. So we are going to just summarize this picture by just a simple picture like this. This is called a neuron. And implicitly, we are saying all of these x's are multiplied with the vector w. There is a bias term here. And there is an activation function uh, in the neuron. So my output would be phi of w transpose x plus b. So it is implicit in this picture. So we just don't want to like, you know, carry all of these um, uh, notations in in different uh, networks that we'll have. Okay, so one way to add nonlinearity would be to add multiple neurons in one layer, or you can add them in cascaded layers. So what do I mean by that? So you have x1 to xd, and then you have, say, one neuron here connected to all of these inputs. You can add more than one neuron. And 
then you can treat the output of these neurons as your input to the next layer. So you can add other layers to your network. And at the end of the day, let's say you'll have, let's say 10 outputs, if you have a 10 uh, class classification probe. Okay, as I mentioned, so these outputs, you need to turn them into probabilities. So you add the soft, soft max layer here to turn them into probabilities for uh, predictions of each class. All right, so this is called the input layer for obvious reasons. These are hidden layers for my network. And this is the output layer. The numbers that we have here, we call it logits. And after the softmax, these are the probabilities for predicting different uh, classes. So this whole uh, network is called a multi-layer perceptron network. So this is called multi-layer perceptron or MLP. Or sometimes people, they refer to it as fully connected feedforward network. Connected feedforward network. So the number of hidden layers is the depth of your your network. So this is the depth and the number of uh, neurons in each layer is the width of your network. So there was a question earlier, why this is called deep learning? Because in most of the uh, state of the art architectures, we need depth to be high in order to achieve a good performance. And most of the architectures, uh, some of them that we'll uh, see today, uh, they have uh, quite a high depth uh, and that's why it is called deep learning. Uh, but believe it or not, even sometimes, you know, people, they have uh, one hidden layer and they call it deep learning, but that's another uh, story. Uh, in those cases, I think we should refer them to as shallow network or you can call them shallow learning. If we, uh, if you are using those types of uh, networks, that's it for the MLP. Uh, any questions? All right. So if not, let's move on. So another very important uh, network uh, architecture is the convolution, uh, convolutional networks, convolutional neural. networks or CNNs. Especially on images, uh, CNNs are extremely, extremely powerful and most of the state-of-the-art uh, architectures, they use CNNs. All right, so what is the basic idea? All right, so in MLP, in one of the neurons, if you, you, know, if you think about it, so you're applying an activation function to an affine transformation of uh, X. So in a convolutional network, we are going to use a convolution operator in order to transform, linearly transform x to some, um, some other vectors. So we are going to convolve x uh, with w and that will be the output of the convolution. So this is called the convolution uh, operator. Again, similar to w transpose x, it is uh, an affine uh, operator. So it is not uh, adding nonlinearity to our system. So the nonlinearity is gonna come using this uh, phi transformation. So let's uh, look at CNNs with a very simple example. Let's look at the one dimensional example. So I don't wanna go into the mathematical notation because the concept is in fact very simple. So here we have x, let's say we have a four dimensional x with the numbers one, three, 
10, 5. These are my pixel values. Now I'm gonna have a filter. Let's say uh, my filter is something like this, uh, plus one, minus one. So this is my W. These are my weights. So I'm gonna look at the inner product between this vector and this part of my image. So what is the result of that inner product? One times one plus three times minus one. So I'll get a minus two as my output. You know, basically report uh, minus two. And then with the parameter, which is the stride, I'm gonna shift my weight. I'm gonna maybe shift by one if my stride is one. If my stride is two, I'm gonna shift by two. And again, I'm gonna look at the inner product, the similarity of my filter with this portion of my uh, input. In that case, I'll get a minus seven, for instance. And keep going. At the ends, you know, there are, uh, you know, different ways you can pad zeros in order to uh, look into the edges or you can, you know, do a circular convolution. Uh, those are like minor details, but that's the basic idea of the convolution operator. And then you apply your nonlinearity on top of it. So you have, uh, let's say, a ReLU or uh, any other activation functions and apply your nonlinearity on top of uh, these uh, the outputs of your convolution uh, operation. Okay, so what would be my output size? Roughly speaking, if my input, let's say, is in D dimension, and if my stride is a certain number, my output size here, not exactly, but approximately, it is going to be my input size over the stride number. Uh, there are some, you know, uh, you know, edge cases that we should consider, uh, but uh, when D is large enough, so my output size would converge to this number. And sometimes, you know, when your stride is one, it means you are not reducing your dimensionality after uh, doing this convolution operation. Uh, and sometimes we actually need to reduce the dimensionality. For that purpose, there is oftentimes a pooling step that we, uh, let's say, look into adjacent uh, pixels if my uh, pooling stride is two, and I'm gonna take the maximum or uh, sum of these uh, values, and I'm going to reduce my dimensionality based on that. So this is the pooling layer. Oftentimes it is added uh, for uh, on top of the convolution operator. So in other words, a convolution layer, uh, you can think about it, convolution layer, you can think about it as the following. So you have your input X, then you have a convolution operator. This is an affine transformation. You apply your activation function and there may be a pooling layer. You can do a max pooling or uh, average pooling. And this whole thing is called a convolution layer. So convolutions are extremely, extremely important uh, in order to uh, uh, basically deal with image applications. Uh, just to give you an example, AlexNet, which is one of the very popular architectures on uh, classifications on ImageNet. We have, uh, I believe, five layers of convolutions. First, and then, so these are convolutions, com layers, and then there are a couple of uh, fully connected layers after that. Fully uh, connected layers. So convolutions are extremely, extremely important. Okay, so um, there are some questions. Um, is pooling, uh, does pooling add nonlinearity to the system? Uh, yes, for instance, if you look at the max pooling, the relationship is a nonlinear from the input to the output. Another question, is this truly related to math convolution? Uh, yes and no. Um, the math convolution, there's a transpose, uh, but here we don't do the transpose. So in the uh, convolution, 
correct convolution operator. So you, if you want to you know, do the convolution of this part and this part, you've got to transpose this. But then consider the transpose value as your filter. Uh, and you know, in that case, that would you know, give you the same result. So this is, in fact, called cross-correlation, as one of you mentioned. But it is very, very related to the convolution operator. So that's why, that's why these, these are called convolutional layers. OK, um, perfect. Uh, all right, so that's it for uh, the um, for the models. Okay, so let's move on. Again, let's uh, recall what was my ERM. I'm minimizing over W sum of my losses between FW of XI and YI. Okay, so uh, so far we know what loss functions are. We know what is FW, uh, MLP, convolution, or maybe other types of you know, functions. And now we wanna see how we can solve this optimization uh, problem. If FW, basically the, the basic question here is how to solve the optimization problem. OK, so if my objective is convex, let's call the whole thing L of W. So this is my objective function. If L of W is convex, uh, that happens because my loss is convex, and if my f of w is an affine function, I'll get the convex optimization at the end. I'm very happy because uh, I know gradient descent or stochastic um, uh, or stochastic. Uh, so what is these notifications? Or the stochastic gradient descent can be used gradient descent can be used to find W star, which is my global optimizer. So I'll have L of W in that case, something like this. It is convex. So this is my W. This is my W star. So the way that we will solve this problem, we'll start with some initial value for W, let's say W0. And I'm going to move in the opposite direction of my gradient. And if my learning rate, my step sizes are properly set, I'm going to converge to uh, W star at the end of the day. So that's the uh, gradient descent algorithm. So basically, we start with some initialization for my weights, random initializations. You can use like Gaussians. And then weights at iteration t plus one will be my weights at iteration t minus eta, which is my learning rate, times the gradient of my loss at the previous iteration. So this eta called learning rate. And here we are using a fixed learning rate. OK, so if you think about this uh, gradient of the loss, my loss is sum of the losses of individual samples. In that case, my gradient is going to be the sum of the gradients that I'll observe over individual samples. So I have one over n, the gradient of uh, loss on individual samples. And this computation can be very expensive because we need to compute gradient at each of the samples for n samples in each iteration. So it is a, it's an expensive uh, step. So in order to uh, reduce the computational cost, we can uh, take samples, random samples, from our training set in order to approximate this uh, gradient. So that's the key idea of a stochastic gradient descent. So in the stochastic gradient descent, uh, it is very similar to the gradient descent. The only difference here is that instead of looking at the uh, 
uh, average gradient over all samples, we are going to look at the average on a mini batch. So we have W t plus one would be W of t minus eta. Let's say my mini batch size is B and I'm gonna look at a set of samples in this mini batch, uh, usually much smaller than, um, um, than uh, what um, uh, we have in our training set, W of xi and yi. So this is called my mini batch. Okay, so this is the SGD. And in fact, SGD works very well in, uh, in practice and it is, um, you know, computationally also inexpensive. Uh, for the convex uh, functions, there are some uh, proofs that gradient descent uh, converges with an exponential rate. Uh, you should take a look into some of those, uh, some of those proofs. So I'm gonna review some of them in the next lecture. Uh, for SGD, if your learning rate is adjusted properly uh, for convex optimization, it also uh, converges to your global uh, optimizer. Okay, but now in deep learning, uh, again, there's a trade-off, right? So the linear function was good, but uh, we have a limited representation power. But in deep learning, we have a nonlinear function uh, and it may, we may end up getting a non-convex uh, optimization problem at the end. So non-convex optimization problem. So how can we deal with this problem? So even in that case, we are using the same algorithms. We are using gradient descent or a stochastic gradient descent in order to solve the non-convex optimization problem. So one of the mysteries that uh, we have been thinking about is why, in fact, SGD or gradient descent works well in many cases, uh, in many non-convex deep learning optimization problems. Not in all of them, but in many uh, optimization problems, they work pretty well. So why is that the case? So that's basically going to be the topic for uh, our next lecture to see what is special about these deep learning architectures that even though we have a non-convex optimization, these local search methods, they work pretty well. Do we get a loss function like this? Because if I get a loss function like this, and if I start my SGD here, then I'm gonna end up in this point, which is a bad, and poor local, local minima compared to this point, which is my global minima. Is this the picture that we should have in mind? Or maybe we don't get a non-convexity like this, and that's why SGD uh, works well in uh, practice. Uh, okay, so uh, there are other variations of uh, these local search methods like momentum, um, momentum, you can also have momentum plus SGD. So here you are not using the gradient itself, but you're keeping some updates and combine it with your gradient in case your curvature is high, so you don't wanna change the update direction suddenly. So your uh, updates will have some momentum from the previous parts. You can combine that with SGD. And there are some um, uh, solvers that use adaptive learning rate. Adaptive learning rates. So the main idea is that if your gradient, if your gradient is large in terms of the norm, it means you, uh, if you use a fixed rate, then the parameter assigned to that will change significantly. So you want your learning rate to be small. And if your gradient is small, then you uh, want your learning rate to be larger because otherwise you are not going to significantly change your uh, parameter. So uh, some of the interesting algorithms here uh, are RMS prop and Adam, which is basically the 
combination of RMS prop uh, with uh, momentum with some uh, with some uh, changes. So unfortunately, we don't have uh, time to go into the details. So you can you know take a look at some of these concepts. These are you know very practical uh, solvers uh, in for deep learning uh, optimizations. Right. So let me see if there are some questions. Um, yeah, so the, the derivatives of the pooling or the whole network, uh, you can use a chain rule uh, in order to compute it. There's a, there's a very efficient algorithm called backprop in order to compute the gradient. So you should take a look into that. Uh, there's another question. Are these works on analyzing SGD with random box on the lost surface due to the noise of the gradient? Yes, there are some uh, works on analyzing SGD. Uh, so next lecture, we are going to uh, read some of these papers. Uh, first, we'll look into the gradient descent, full batch gradient descent, and then we'll look into uh, understanding SGD. So any other questions? So just a note, if there are no more questions, um, make sure to read the papers. Uh, before um, before the next lecture. So actually I see one uh, hand is being raised. Uh, Paul Kate, go ahead. Uh, yes, so I just have one question that, uh, how do you go about choosing which optimizer to use, whether to use uh, like RMS prop Adam or SGD? Is there a trick? Or the question? Uh, excellent question. Uh, the answer is we don't know. So it's very empirical and uh, our understanding of these optimizers are not um, deep enough. So in practice, uh, oftentimes you try some of these uh, different optimization problems and then uh, see which one uh, works the best. Uh, there's another hand raised. Go ahead. Hi, Professor. Uh, with the local minimum and the global minimum di uh, diagram that you showed, is it, isn't it more probable that we'll get saddle points instead? Uh, like yes. Yes, there is a also like a saddle point problem when you have uh, some eigenvalues of the Hessians that are uh, positive and some eigenvalues are negative. Uh, so I'm going to talk about that. In fact, having SGD is helpful in skipping those saddle points because you add a little bit of randomness so in other words, even though SGD is very computationally efficient, it also helps us to not uh, basically um, trap in those saddle points. Uh, but in fact, that picture that I draw is not very accurate. So that's why I put a question mark. And uh, that's basically something that we'll uh, dig a little bit deeper uh, in the next lecture. Okay, any other uh, questions? Uh, so my question is along the same lines as Pulkit's. Uh, is there an intuition behind what stride to choose when we are uh, designing a convolution CNN, basically? Yeah, there are some intuitions. Uh, for instance, uh, one uh, main thing is the power of over parameterizations in the deep learning. So in fact, we'll see in the next couple of uh, lectures that when your number of parameters are larger, in fact, than the number of training samples, uh, very interesting behaviors are happening in non-convex optimization problems. Uh, and you know, that's one, one of them. But there are a lot of uh, empirical observations that we do not have good theoretical foundations about them yet. And uh, potentially, if I teach this course in uh, 2025, you know, maybe we'll include you know, some other topics to justify those empirical observations. Yes, you know, the answer is like partially yes. We'll, you know, within this course, we'll develop some intuitions about some of the empirically relevant uh, deep learning optimization problems and applications, but the picture is not going to be complete. So this is a very active area of research. Uh, all right, so I see some other hands are raised. Go ahead. Hi, for the group project, will we have access to any additional computing resources? Uh, 
Uh, yes, so I'll uh, make a post about that uh, shortly. Any other questions? All right, uh, if not, uh, thank you everyone. Have a great day and I'll see you on Thursday.